Good morning, I'm Ahmed Al Nagar and this is Monday Legal. Back to the English lawyers. Today my guest is Sabina Malik, Senior Legal Counsel of VA Consultancy. Good morning, good morning Sabina. Good morning, Mr. Ahmed, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Pleasure thank you for your show today. Thank you very much for coming here. And I will ask you the same question I ask everybody. What is your morning drink? I'd say Americano if you're asking me about coffee, but otherwise I am a teaholic. Oh. Earl Grey or English breakfast, tea okay. with milk. <laughs> that's, that's a very English thing, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Good. I made a quick introduction about you and what you do now, but I would like that you take us through your legal journey. Where did you start? Why did you start with the law? And until you are here now. I'm a second generation lawyer and I actually went into the legal profession as a mature student. So prior to joining law school, I was working as a TV presenter and uh, I also used to negotiate contracts for a, a production a business. How I, uh, my journey into law, how I joined the profession. So it goes back to my childhood. I'm a second generation lawyer. In fact, it was my father's brother who was the first lawyer in our family. And all of us, so that's including my siblings, my cousins, all of the children within the family at that time, we all went through his office and gained work experience. So usually school holidays, we were in working alongside him and uh, doing all admin duties and uh, all the good work. And so from there, the journey sort of began and I got some legal exposure, but along the way, so after 20 years of being a, a high profile lawyer within the community, my uncle decided to open a TV channel and I then decided to follow him rather than go to law school at that point. And I started to present programs and uh, slots and uh, he'd sort of guide me, help me, and I learned my way around media and it was lots of fun. And at the same time, my brother and my cousin opened a production studio. And so then I became involved in negotiating contracts with agents, hiring models for them, hiring cars, helicopters, background setups, whatever they needed to get the videos done. They were also doing concerts, live concerts. So then we needed a big team and we all had our individual roles to play. So most of my time was spent between, well, most of my week weekends, I'd say, was spent between Manchester and London. I'd drive down and uh, do all the meetings, have the negotiations and then come back. So anyway, at this point, um, loving life, work is great. And of course. It's a family <laughs> business setup and it's all very safe and friendly and, and, I, and I love uh, being in the, in the limelight. I get to the age of 27 and at this point uh, my marriage fails, unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you look <laughs> at it, and I decide to take a different direction in life. So I have a young daughter and I think, what is it that I really want to achieve in life? Do I really want to be doing this for the next 20 years? And if I want a different direction, then how am I going to achieve those goals? I'm no longer interested in the limelight. I don't want to be popular. I don't want followers. I don't want all these friends. Because I'm looking at the wider picture of all these people that are within my circle. How many of those would actually take a bullet for me if things went wrong? And I could count them on two hands. So at that point, I just shut myself away. I did my application for law school, Manchester University. I attended the interview. I got through. And then uh, three years I spent doing my degree. After that, I did uh, another year of my post-graduation, did my LPC, and then two years training contract in order to get onto the role and become a qualified solicitor. So, as I say, age is no barrier. It's important that you do pursue your goals, you have a dream, you want to achieve that. And there's many, many high-profile people, high-profile businessmen that have achieved success much later in life, in the 50s, 60s. You are as young as you feel, as young as, young as your mind is, as young as your heart is, and you really do need to keep evolving, learning, educating yourself as time goes on. So potentially in a nutshell, that's how I ended up in law. I think you have a quick introduction to the law as a profession through the time you did the fashion and you did the, the, the events by getting involved and getting connected to running transactions like, I don't know, the contracts that you have been signing between the venue and the organizing the production company, the, uh, I don't know, hiring the models and, and, and stuff like this. Was this the interesting part or what did actually make this change from your mind that you leave, I don't know, the glamour, events, TV, being a presenter, going into the, I don't know, the backside of it, which is just the legal work and the documents. What was this change? I mean, why did you do this change? The shift in mindset, I think the trigger was my divorce and 
at that point, I didn't want my old life. I wanted to change. So it was just at that point when they say, Khalas, I'm done. <laughs> I was literally done in every direction. Right. And at that point, I thought, I just want to, you know when you want to just recreate yourself and be a new person and not be in that old mindset, that was the shift. So although I was exposed as a child to the legal world, I was going to my uncle's office. I would sit in the boardroom with him, attend meetings. We would go to court with him, attend hearings. Well, sit in the audience and watch. And we would be in the office and watch him have the meetings and take notes. And so I was very, very much involved in law as a child as well. We all were, as I say, it was a family business and we were all sort of put through uh, the office and, mm. uh, and it's expected. In fact, we have about 10 lawyers within the family, of which are three are barristers and seven solicitors. We do have medics as well, five medics and the rest have all gone into business, various different businesses. So it was sort of instilled into my mind as a child, but I had a, creati- a very creative streak. And that was why I went into a sort of fashion and media at that point. Right. Um, going back then, as I say, to that type of work I was doing, yes, heavily contract law was very much involved. Negotiation skills were very much involved. And also, I grew up in a very extended family unit. So my father and his brothers, uh, he, he, the four brothers and one sister, they lived literally five minutes walking distance from one another. The reason behind that is because they moved into a very affluent area in the UK. They came from abroad, they did very well. And then they wanted the children, the next generation, to have the best in life. And at the same time, we were a minority. There were not many ethnic minority families living in the area. So all my friends, white, um, didn't understand my culture, didn't understand my background, didn't understand my religion. And so my father and his brothers made the decision that we must stay together. So the children are together and we can make family decisions whereby we instill culture and religion into the children, into the next generation. And they don't lose that because in a foreign country, it's very, very easy to step away. And so I was raised by my grandma. My grandma had, uh, well, my grandparents, in fact, both had a, had a great hand in uh, raising all the grandchildren we would very much be involved with the the cultural side of things through my grandparents because my parents were very modern, very liberal. They sort of flowed with the times. In fact, my father, as well as running his his day-to-day business, he also was a sports agent on the side as a hobby. So uh, sports and uh, he, he sort of dealt with cricket. Growing up, as I say, my father was a businessman and my mum worked alongside him. And uh, at the same time, he was a sports agent on the side as a hobby. So, you know, weekends, evenings, he would play at the local club, Lord and Cricket Club, and coach. And also he would uh, do tournaments around and travel the world. Very, very well-traveled man. And uh, spent a lot of my childhood playing cricket with my father. Okay. Within the house, we had a games room. So snooker, pool, badminton. You know, we, we, we had all the facilities within the house. And so I did spend a lot of time doing a lot of sports with my father, swimming on the weekends. And uh, again, my uncles were there, my cousins were there. We were a big family unit. My grandparents would take us to mosque on the weekends. I have been raised in a Muslim household, Sunni Muslim. And they would take us for Umrah. My father was specifically travelled to the east with, and to the uh, Middle East so that we, the culture was instilled within us. So I could quite easily switch from wearing a short dress to putting my abaya on without thinking about it because it's all cultural. Mm-hmm. I could very easily sit on a dining table and use my knife and fork. But at the same time, my grandma, for some reason, possibly because she didn't want to do much washing up, would sit all her grandchildren on the floor and put a blanket down, either in the lounge or in the garden. And then she'd have a big platter and we would all eat from that one platter and use our hands at times. So that was quite humbling, as in, you know, we did get the mixture and I'm very, very grateful that my grandma did have that hand in, in raising us and put, instilling all that sort of culture and, uh, into, into all her grandchildren. And we thoroughly enjoyed it. So yeah, I could quite easily switch and it was nice because uh, we would have that private setup in the house, which we didn't really show outside to our friends, but it was nice just to have that bond within the family. I relate a lot to your um experience having um, spending part of your childhood in a law firm and uh, with among uh, fellow lawyers from the family because I have a, a similar experience my three elder sisters are lawyers my dad is a lawyer as well I entered the law firm at the age of maybe seven years old and most of his lawyers were the, the lawyers who work with him at the firm were all treated as family so he had even a, a lot of uh, other friends and friends of friends who are lawyers within our community so I can relate to that and when I grew up and I 
decided to go into the profession. It was very easy as a decision because I understood how it works from the very early beginning and I didn't have one role model. I had a lot of images from each one in the family and each one of them had quite a strong position on uh, someone who have a very was very well respected because of his image, someone else who have a being very, very smart and sharp, another one who was an avid reader and every single trait of, of, of each one of them have shaped a little bit how impressed I was with the profession and it shaped a lot how much I like it. So I relate to that very much. And I think having a stable, strong family ties also creates something that is very strong in any lawyer's mind because when you have a strong family um, household as you said you always get a lot of guidance and these guidance uh, heighten your morality and the principles and uh, religious ties were never apart so all of this uh, combined makes it a lot easier for a lawyer to have a high moral ground or a lot of connection to justice and to fairness and these are values that all the lawyers should have. So I can imagine that your childhood and upbringing was very much connected to, to this and it made it easy for you to switch when you made a change in your life from media and the glamour of being a presenter and being into sports and so on. And you had the chance to maybe do a 10 other things that probably was much easier than studying law all of a sudden from start and switching to a very hard profession. So I understand now, I mean, the background now makes a lot of sense. It's nice to know that you can relate, and that you had a similar upbringing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So definitely. Then I will come to the next to the next question. How did your start in the legal field in the UK? I mean, so as I say, it was a three years degree, a year LEC, and then two years training contract. And I started my training contract with my uncle. Okay. And whilst I was doing my training contract, a job role came up. One of the leading firms of Manchester. In fact, at the time, Pannoni LLP was the leading law firm of Manchester, and very difficult to get into. And I, and I did submit my application, thinking in the back of my mind, I'm not going to get this job. I'm going to have to com complete my training here probably. And I just sent it off and didn't think about it. A week or so later, I got an email requesting to have a, a, a coffee, just a general chat. It wasn't an interview at all from Pannoni. So I agreed, I attended. And the head of department took a liking to me, to my story, and offered me the position. Which department was that? That was in the litigation department. Litigation. But as, as a, a trainee, you have to do four yeah. different seats. So at that point, I was over the moon. I'm thinking, wow, I'm in Pannoni, you know. Done it. So I approached my uncle and I told him, I said, you know, I've got this offer and I really want to complete my training there. I probably won't ever get this chance again. Please, can you just let me go now? I'm going to hang my notice in. He was very, very upset. But he could also see that I have more potential at a bigger firm. And uh, he pushed me to go as well. So I ended up there and I learned my way around the four seats I had to do. I completed those. And then after my training contract, finished, I ended up the litigation department, however, not private client based. They at that point opened uh, a department where they were doing third party funding, which I understand is not huge in the UAE yet, but in the UK, it's quite a big area. And so I learned how to deal with funders, how to deal with insurance companies, because we had about 11 or 12 different books open with different insurance companies. And I realized that sometimes claimants have very lucrative, meritorious claims that they can't bring to the court doors because of lack of finances or resources. And so third party funding was a very fair way to help claimants bring justice to the table and to level out the playing field, especially if you're dealing with big boys on the other side. Once I sort of learned my way around third party funding, I then came to the UAE to start doing talks about it. Now, my journey in the UAE actually started in 2010. And what had happened at that point was Amna Alouez, a register, well, she was chief registrar of, uh, of DIFC at the time. I think her position's changed now. She reached out to me and we had a, a a chat on Twitter and uh, asked if I'd be interested in doing some pro bono work for the DIFC because they didn't have many lawyers. There was a handful, I think two or three they had. So I agreed to join and the four of us then, there was three, three chaps and myself and we started to run with the, the pro bono scheme and I was doing it online based in my home in Manchester. 
where I, where I live. So I know before you move here, I mean, you recently moved to the UAE permanently and, to, and you're taking this um, job, but you have been in the UAE more than 10 years ago and you've been connected uh, to the UAE, especially through the DIFC Pro Bono. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So in 2010, I was on a Twitter chat with Amna Alouez. She was chief registrar of DIFC at the time. I think her position's changed now. And we decided that I'd come and meet her in, in Dubai, have a coffee and just discuss next steps. And the thing is, at the time, they had limited people that wanted to be involved with pro bono. The mind, as a UK lawyer, you were pushed to do pro bono work, even at university. is part and parcel you give and you receive to the, and you give back to the community. And at that point, as I say, there were three other lawyers. One was a, a local lawyer in UAE, one was an Egyptian lawyer in London, and one was an Egyptian lawyer in Cairo, I believe. And then I joined, so as a British lawyer in the UK. And the four of us ran the scheme. I was working from my home. It was maybe half an hour to an hour a day, not more than that. And usually on... Labour law, maybe? It was all mainly labour law. And yeah. as I said, inquiries were just dealt with online. Yeah. I think a couple of times I had to speak to someone on the phone just to go into a bit more detail. But they were short inquiries. And, and then if I were, ever was in Dubai, I would attend the clinics live and give the give advice and at that point as I say nobody really wanted to do any pro bono work it was actually something that uh, wasn't up and coming or respected in any way in the Middle East at that time so then when the DIFC did a huge ceremony and an award ceremony each of us, each four of us received an award and Michael Huang flew in from Singapore to present the awards and all of a sudden in Dubai it's a big deal everybody now wants to be part of the DIFC pro bono scheme so I can ha quite happily say that I was one of the first lawyers to receive that award albeit I was a foreign lawyer working remotely I achieved that and I set a, a, a stance for everyone else to start following so yeah yeah that's very significant thank you so much for that I would like did you speak a little bit about your experience during the time you worked in Manchester with the third party funding? Because as you rightly said, it's not something that is very commonly uh, practiced in the UAE. We've been there, some companies are doing it, some big law firms are doing it for, for specific cases. But I would like to learn more how does that work in, in UK because it seems like a widely uh, used practice. Yes, um, in a nutshell, third party funding means that you have a funder involved. So what you would do is initially you sign up with an insurance company to become panel lawyers. And so that insurance company, for example, I have insurance for any legal work, whether somebody tries to sue me or I want to sue somebody, I've got that package linked to my home insurance. So when I buy my home insurance, I buy the legal package with it. If, God forbid, that situation arises where either somebody tries to sue me or I want to sue somebody, I can just approach the policy and say I'd like to bring a claim or I would like to be defended. And they would then tell me that these are the panel solicitors that are available to you and you can choose. I can also then go forward and say I don't want to use your panel solicitors because I want to use a firm that I'm more comfortable with but you have to give good reasoning to step aside from that. Uh, insurance companies don't always agree and you can then appoint someone that you would like instead and what would happen then is you do not get paid during the life of the claim that's the thing you're taking a risk and you only take that risk based upon a barrister's advice. So at, right at the at the beginning, your lawyer would submit everything to the barrister to say that, you know, this is the case, this is what's happened, and come we get advice. So so long as advice is more than 65% of success in court, you would run with it because that's good. And so at that point, the funders that come in to back the insurance companies, they provide all of funding that you need for any disbursements, court fees, etc. And what happens at the end of the case then is you claim all of that back. Under common law, facility exists, winner will claim all the costs back from the loser, whereas I, in the civil law system that is yeah. the case. So this is how, how third party funding would work. And along the way, so for example, if we've issued proceedings and we are ready now to start trial, we'd also then take a different policy out called after the event ATE policy. So in the event, if I was defending a claimant and they had third party funding in place and potentially there's still a small percentage where they could lose and so I'm taking a risk. At that point, I take an ATE policy out after the event and that would cover my client. You just pay, pay a small premium for that. It could be £1,000 or £5,000 depending on the value of the claim and you 
then protect your client against any loss. If your client was to lose, the ATE policy would kick in and pay the claimant's cost to the defend well, the potential defendant at the time, if the defendant was to win. So, you know, you cover your client off and there's uh, policies available in any event. And the thing is, the mindset for third party funding is if you can't afford to knock on the court door, then you would take funding. Businesses and corporations need to understand is that sometimes you do not want to disrupt your balance sheet. So if you have got a large litigation going on in the court and thousands and thousands of dollars are going out of your, your account on a weekly, monthly basis, quarter, you've got your account for that as a loss. So why would you not try, try third party funding rather than disrupt your balance sheet? if that's the case. Of course, there would be merits you have to go through to in order to get the funding. Not everyone's successful, but it's it's open there for businesses and corporations too. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant concept. And, and I can imagine as well that the UAE, let's say clients, the customers in the UAE corporations here are very much open for such a solution if it's offered to them. The question comes here whether uh, there are insurance companies who are willing to take on such risk and they are happy to pay for such um, solutions. Have you seen any successful cases happening in the UAE within this period? Uh, since I've been here, as I say, I've not done any third party funding. I've only been in the UAE almost four months, yeah. and a half, four months ago I arrived. But I have had panel discussions with third party funders based in UAE, and they are running the businesses successfully. As I say, it's not large scale yet. The word needs to get out more in the market but there's potential and scope to grow. So you recently moved to the UAE like four months ago and um, you're coming from the UK, from Manchester. And I can imagine that uh, the UAE is quite different as a society and uh, different as well as uh, in the professional life. So how does this change affect you so far? It's not really affected me in a way where I've been homesick, which is good. And I appreciate that whichever country you travel to, there are going to be differences. But I've been traveling to Dubai since 2006. It's a hot spot for family vacation. We come here a few times a year. And as I say, since 2010, I've been traveling here for, for events and legal forums. And I do a lot of public speaking in the UAE as well. So I think the difference was I'm no longer now coming, staying in a hotel for a few weeks and going back. I'm actually having to then rent a place and make it home. And I think that was the biggest difference. And learning to drive on the opposite side of the road. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that can be a challenge. So I'm personally here for the last 16 years. I believe leave the first two years for me was trying to understand how everything works. Even I came from uh, a civil law jurisdiction like uh, Egypt and I lived also in Cairo. My dad is a lawyer and I grew up in a law firm and that is very similar to how local Emirati law firms here work and operate. But still, the UAE is a very unique place for a foreign lawyer to come and practice here. We have three different jurisdictions. We have federal courts. We have a huge difference between what the lawyer or the advocate can do and what a legal consultant can do, either if, even if they speak the same language and got the exact same education. So how easy was it for you? to move from Manchester, from UK to Dubai, the UAE? I'd say the challenges are present, albeit I've overcome them as they have arisen. The main thing is I've not been homesick so far. <laughs> Good. So that's positive. And as I say, driving on the other side of the road was the, the biggest challenge I faced, <laughs> which is not related <laughs> to law, but you know, uh, on a personal level. Coming from a common law jurisdiction, the differences are huge in a civil law. So what I decided to do was join a local law firm as soon as I touched soil and I joined Ralk Law Firm in Business Bay uh, run by Mr. Ehab. He has two Emirati partners, he's Egyptian himself, mm -hmm. lovely chap and I learned the system, the civil law system. So I just sat with the lawyers, I talked to them and I asked them questions. I looked at the systems that they were using to do the searches, for example, if a property dispute's arisen, how are they doing the researches as to how far the property's developed, who the developers are, etc., etc., and how they put the files together, the case together to attend court. So I was just observing, I was learning, I was watching, asking lots of questions, made my connections. And within the law firm, Ms. Dehab has all facilities available, so in-house accountants, in-house attendant who will go to the police station if anything happens, in-house, local lawyers. Everything is within the premises, so it's very easy for me to just go from room to room and learn 
what I needed to learn. And so, again, shift in mindset, shift in direction, learn something new. And you can't really make a comparison between the two because they're just so different. With civil laws, you know, it goes back, stems back, I'd say, from Roman law times. And that's the basis for the structure of, of uh, civil law. It's set, set, set in stone and it can't be changed. Whereas common law is going back to England when the king was ruling and it's legislative and it can be changed and evolved as time goes on. The system in itself, I've come working as a solicitor, so my role would be to make that initial contact with the client, take down all the details of the case, to then issue proceedings. So I would draft a claim form, draft the particulars of the claim. I'd then serve the defendant, review the defence, do a reply to defence, take my client's instructions, draft the witness statements, do the directions questionnaires, do all the, the case management steps. So that's all on me. I do advice to client, to the barrister, so advice to counsel to say, this is what's happened, this is what we think. You know, can you suggest case law on this matter and your thoughts? So you know, you need to prepare the barrister as well before they attend any hearing I don't advocate myself but the reason why I would approach a barrister is to then attend to do the advocacy side of things and a barrister is only as good as the instructions and the evidence that you put forward to them so there's a lot for me to do in this lister and uh, coming then here as you say the, the roles are very much divided and then the judge is making all the decisions and the lawyers are not doing even half the work that I would be doing sat in the, uh, at a desk in the UK. So as I say, I came to, to UAE initially and made my connections as soon as I landed in February. I was with Ralk full time for two months and it was a great learning opportunity. And we are still connected and we are still working together and there's lots of collaboration opportunities there. But at the same time, a month ago, I also joined a international law firm in the DFC. That's a new area of law that's come about for me, as I say, um, blockchain, digital assets, Web3. At the moment, we are tokenizing assets. And so we've started with real estate. In real estate, you could have a property, just hypothetically speaking, it could be $100,000. And you can't find one investor to take that off your hands. And you really do need to raise $100,000. So what you could do then is tokenize, divide it into pieces, tokenize it, say $1,000 each. Then the tokens would potentially be your digital registry on the blockchain and sell each one for $1,000. And you've got 100 investors, you've, got, you've made your money. So it's a good way of, of financing when you need to. On the blockchain, everything is secure because it's digitalized and it can't be tampered with, fraud is eliminated. And as well as real estate, we've tokenized carbon credits. Again, it helps the environment. We have tokenized in sports law, where if a athlete has a contract, fans can now buy into that on the blockchain and they can receive a monthly investment in the form of uh, interest. So all of this is governed by a smart contract. I have not come across any lawyers yet that can draft smart contracts. So we then have an IT department that does that for us. And I suppose the way forward in the future would be for lawyers to also learn coding and become more technically involved with the work because that is the way forward. So your, your smart contract can be designed in a way where you have triggers. If X happens, then Y will also happen. happen. If A happens, then B happens. And so for example, if uh, if you're in a sports contract and if you could put in there, if, if a player leaves, I receive X amount. So as soon as they leave, you'd automatically receive that amount. So you just put your triggers in, it's much faster, it's much quicker eliminate the supply chain so for example if you are in uh, although real estate owners uh, businesses have not really come into the blockchain yet because lack of regulation and even within the UAE we are working with regulators so we are working with Dubai Land Department we're working with uh, ADGM, DFC, RERA and having discussions as to how to align regulations so that there's more stability and there's uh, more confidence within the market to bring more players into the blockchain and at the same time as I say we've started to do talks about it with the Dubai government and we are available on the stages. A very very interesting area for me to get involved in at this stage and it's evolving, it's growing and I hope to be a part of the success going forward. So yes, VA consultant are doing great work and as well as tokenizing assets and an, an asset can be anything it could be real estate it could be carbon credit it could be sports law it could be data that you've received yeah. it could be a form of art anything can be tokenized so i'll take you to a particular asset class which is the one of the most uh, desirable assets in especially in a place like the uae and we see a lot uh, a lot of investors are flocking to buy real estate here, especially from neighboring countries where they have uh, maybe conflicts or they have financial troubles in their economies. They 
run to save the money by investing in real estate in the UAE. And that's why the property market have surged a lot in the last few years. When we talk about tokenizing real estate, there are a few challenges because of the, le- of the regulation. I understand that the Bailand Department still requires to have the ultimate beneficial owner registered and named for each owner, whether it's a company or even an individual, to be registered with the Bailand Department. How do you go about that kind of challenge when we are tokenizing the real estate itself? I'm not going to go into any detail. I'm yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> uh, but if anyone's interested, they can always reach out offline and we can have a consultation. But it, it is possible. It could be, as I say, I don't want to say too much okay. on the spot. Yeah. And uh, it's just a general sort of overview of what we do. Because as well as, as tokenization, we do fintech setups. We also do sports law because right. of public demand. And we have been working on film production contracts. So one we've completed is done. And currently, I can't disclose details because we've signed NDAs. Sure. But we are currently involved in another production at the moment. Do you tokenize media products as well? We will be doing. Yeah, OK. So we are go- it's, a, it's an area of law that we are going to look into. So sports law and media law, we are going to expand into tokenizing in that area as well. That can be very, very interesting. It will be. So the, the moment you close that deal, we will bring you back to talk about it. Okay. We spoke that you work a lot with fintechs and with uh, startups of businesses. Can you tell us, in your personal opinion, since you are working here for the last few months and you're, you're coming with a UK background, which of the two systems would, you, would be favorable, in your opinion, for investment or for fintech companies or startups in general who are looking for funding? In comparison for civil and... For the civil law, and, yes. Uh, I would say... On a personal level, common law would prevail within a contract. And my reason for that, always uh, make a point with the story. I'm neutral here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so my reason for that would be that you have, between London and Singapore, businesses coming into UAE to set up. So all the economy may, well, the, the population, I should say, is around 2 million. You've got about 2 billion businesses coming into UAE, setting up, and People are a few hours away, so countries which are three or four hours away, people are just traveling in and out. There's lots of traffic in and out of Dubai. Now, as I say, between Singapore and London, all these businesses are coming to set up here, want commercial security. They want to know that if things go wrong, we are protected and they should be given a choice. And the beauty of it is DIFC has, and ADGM have very much understood this point, that if we give the population the choice, they will then have that Comfort. confidence within the system. And that's exactly what the common law brings. It brings transparency. It brings confidence. It brings a level playground. And you know that if I was to, well, if a client is thinking, if I set up a business and things go commercially wrong, I know the system. I know the common law system and the case management is very, very robust. The way that lawyers are trained in the common law system is very, very robust. And also to the point where Emirati judges have been trained in common law to sit and make decisions. So for that reason, and for the economy to keep growing, and for businesses to keep having that trust within the system, I would say common law should be in place, with the option of civil law if, if clients want that in place. But as I say, you know, it's it's more of a commercial decision and to bring that level play, playing field for everyone. Excited to see what the future brings. Welcome to the UAE, and thank you very much for being part of Monday Legal. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it today. It's been great fun. Thank you very much. And this is your dose from Monday Legal. See you next week.